because they're made up 30 years. They're not real. They never happened. So yeah, throw them out the door. I mean, really? Hey guys, welcome or welcome back if you're new here. My name is Shayna, and in my little corner of the internet, we talk about spooky history of all kinds. If that sounds like something you're interested in, be sure to hit that subscribe button and notification bell because I upload on Wednesdays. I also have a podcast called Spooky History with Shayna Blake, and that is where the audio of my video will be. So if that's more your thing, I'll be sure to have a link down in the description for you. Last week, there was no video because that was my recoup week, but I am back today with a fun and interesting story that I found, so let's jump right in. So today, we're gonna be talking about the disappearance and then reappearance of a man named Lawrence Bader. Lawrence, or Larry, we will call him in this episode, was born on December 2nd in 1926 in Akron, Ohio. His father's name was Stephen, and he was a dentist. I'm not sure who the mother was, however, but Larry would be in the Navy between the years of 1944 and 1946, then he would enroll in the University of Akron. He did consider following in his father's footsteps to become a dentist, however, Larry's grades weren't the best and ended up flunking out after just one semester. So that kind of stinks. But during his brief stay at the university, he would end up meeting his future wife, Mary Lou Knapp, and they would end up getting married on April 19th, 1952. I really love that name, Mary Lou. Such a cute name in my opinion. <laughs> Anyways, moving on. Now, in order to support his growing family, Larry would end up getting a job as a cookware salesman for the company called Lifetime Distributors. He was very well liked by his coworkers and clients. Unfortunately, though, the earning potential for this job was pretty limited, which would cause them to struggle. But regardless, he would keep pushing on. I mean, what else is there to do, really? So now let's get into the day of his disappearance. It was May 15th in 1957. Larry told Mary Lou that he needed to drive to Cleveland for work, which is pretty normal for salesmen back in the day. They had to travel to meet people face to face in order to get potential clients and for people to learn about their products. It wasn't like today where they could just send a message or email online. They had to really go out and see the people. But he would tell her that after working in Cleveland, he was hoping to go fishing and would be home late. Now, Mary Lou didn't exactly like the idea of him going fishing after work. Now this was because she was currently pregnant with their fourth child. And if you're a mama, <laughs> you know that if you're pregnant and you have another child or children to take care of, you need all the help you could get. Man, when I was pregnant with my last one, it was so hard to stand during the last month. He was such a big baby. <laughs> it was brutal let me tell you. But so any help that I could get around the house or with my oldest, I took it. So I understand the needing help and her kind of wanting her husband home early, which is something I get. So she suggested him coming home directly after work to help her, but he didn't really like that response. <laughs> so his response was, and I quote, maybe I will and maybe I won't. So there's that. I feel like that's kind of rude, but I mean, different times back then. <laughs> Anyways, Larry would end up driving to Cleveland where he would cash a check for $400 and he would go and pay some outstanding bills, including an installment premium for a life insurance policy that was for him. Then after he was done working, he went to the place called Eddie's Boathouse, which was a boat rental business on the Rocky River, which this is a side note, but in case you didn't know, because I sure didn't know, Rocky River empties into Lake Erie. It was late in the afternoon when he showed up to the river and the man who rented him a boat told Larry that a big storm was coming and he shouldn't stay out very long. But Larry didn't really seem concerned and he paid the man $15 deposit and asked for the the boat to be equipped with lights. Now, the man who rented the boat said he saw Larry holding a suitcase, which was kind of strange, but he didn't bother Larry about it. He just thought he was an odd man, I guess. <laughs> So Larry would get into the boat and make his way along the water. Now the Coast Guard would end up spotting him and told him that the storm was coming and that it wouldn't be safe for him to be out in the water when it gets there. Larry acknowledged them and went on his way. And that was the last time anyone would interact with a man answering to the name Larry 
Bader. Now the following morning, the boat that Larry rented would be found washed up on the shore of Perkins Beach in Lakewood, which is about five miles away from Eddie's boathouse. One of the propellers on the motor was bent and the hole was scratched. But other than that, it didn't appear that the boat had capsized or tipped, nothing. The only thing that they noticed was missing was one of the oars, but all of the life jackets were there and the gas can was empty. But Larry and his suitcase were nowhere to be found. Now the Coast Guard made a detailed search for Larry, but came up with nothing. They said it was impossible that he would have survived that storm, especially without a life jacket. And then after two months, law enforcement believed that there was no way Larry would be found dead or alive. But no one would think to look in Omaha, Nebraska. Almost eight years later, on February 2nd of 1965, Larry's niece Suzanne was standing in front of an archery booth at the Sporting Goods Convention in Chicago, Illinois, when she saw a man with brown hair, a thin mustache, and an eye patch holding court for retailers. Now, aside from this random eye patch and facial hair, he looked just like her uncle, Larry Bader. But that's impossible, right? Because her uncle, was declared dead, right? Now the only reason why Susan was there was because she received a phone call by a man who was from Akron. He told her to hurry over to his sports convention because she was not going to believe what he was seeing. She stared at him for a while before approaching his booth. Then once she got to him, she said, aren't you my Uncle Larry? This man would laugh and then seemed genuinely confused and said, no, I'm not anyone's Uncle Larry. My name is John Johnson. I go by the nickname Fritz. He would go on to tell her that he lived in Omaha, Nebraska, where he was a sports director for a local television station. He was polite but firm. You know, he wanted to make sure that she knew he was not Larry. So he would go on to simply tell her that this was just a big misunderstanding, but Suzanne wasn't buying it. She rushed to the nearby phone and would call her family immediately. Larry's two brothers jumped on a plane from Ohio to Chicago where this Fritz guy was and would confront him. Fritz would go to say that he wasn't their brother. He did agree to go with them to the police station so he could be fingerprinted. Now since Larry was in the Navy, they have his fingerprints on file and this would solve the mystery of if this was Larry or not. So the next day, the police would call the brothers and would tell them that the fingerprints indeed matched, meaning Fritz was their missing brother, Larry Bader. After mysteriously disappearing during a storm on Lake Erie, he ended up being over 700 miles away with a new job, a new face, a new wife, new children, and a completely different set of memories about the first 30 years of his life. Isn't that wild? <laughs> Oh my word, I could not imagine. So it's speculated that sometime between three to five days after Larry disappeared is when the man John Johnson would materialize. He ended up at a restaurant and bar named Ross's Steakhouse in Omaha. He was there looking for a bartending job. It said that he had a drink guide stuffed under his arm as well as a suitcase and a heavy canvas bag along with a Navy issued driver's license. And he would go on to tell his soon to be employer, Mike Shiodros, uh, Shiodo, I don't know, Mike, that he had just gotten out of the Navy after a 14 year stretch. He stated his bad back led him to be discharged and he decided to travel the country for a while. He was staying at the Farnham Hotel near the bus station. He told Mike that he would be a good hire because he used to attend bars at clubs while he was in the service. Well, he won Mike over and got the job. And once the regulars would start to get kind of used to John, they would point out what a peculiar name he had. John had an answer for that. He would go on to tell them that he was originally reared at an orphanage in Boston. He was a baby that was found on the doorstep of an orphanage and when that happens, they give all of the babies the same generic name but with a different nickname. He explained that his nickname was Fritz. They gave him this nickname because people said he reminded them of the character in a Cats and Jimmer kids comic strip. Sorry, hope I pronounced that right. And that comic was popular in the 1920s to 1930s. Now sometimes John's story would change on how he got his nickname. Apparently he would tell people that it came from a short haired cut he got in the service that made him look like a German soldier. But either way, he insisted on just being called Fritz instead of John Johnson. He would 
would sign his checks as Fritz, even his bills were made out to Fritz. He also had an interesting habit of dating his checks by season instead of month, day, and year. An example of this is that if a bill came due in December, he would write winter on it. But other than that, Fritz seemed pretty normal. Everyone found him to be a joy to be around, and Fritz also found joy in everything around him. He was known to go out on dates often. He listened to classical music and proved to be really good at archery. He would even go to win several regional championships. He would be a bartender for a while, but he did have bigger dreams other than bartending. After his shift, he would usually go late at night to a local radio station called KBON to use the recording equipment and practice his broadcasting skills. Then in 1959, he was hired by the station and became somewhat of a local celebrity. He was not hiding at all. Fritz would do some fun stunts, such as sitting in a box on top of a 50-foot flagpole to raise money and awareness for polio. And he would stay up there for 15 days which ended up making him a local legend. Honestly, I could not imagine being in a box for 15 days. (laughs) I'd go crazy. Then in 1961, he would meet and marry a former model named Nancy Zimmer. Nancy had been married before and had a daughter with her previous husband. And after her and Fritz were married, they would welcome a son. Fritz was living the dream. He was happy. He had a great social life, a marriage, a good career. He was very much alive. Meanwhile, back in Akron, Larry Bader was being declared legally dead. So when his niece discovered her uncle Larry at the conference in 1965, Fritz was working part-time as a broadcaster for archery companies. The eye patch I said he was wearing earlier in the episode was he lost his eye because he had a tumor. So he wore an eye patch because of that. But with them discovering that Fritz was really Larry, Fritz's life would begin to crumble. Fritz insisted he had no memory of ever being Larry or he would call him that other fellow. But with Larry reappearing, this would lead to many legal and ethical issues. There were insurance policies worth roughly $40,000, which had been paid out to Mary Lou and now seemed to be null and void. Then there were social security payments sent to Mary Lou and calculated based on him dying would have to be handled. Even the boathouse owner was looking for restitution for damaging his boat. Then there was the matter of the marriage Fritz had with Nancy because Larry was alive, he was legally married to Mary Lou and could be considered a bigamist. So after realizing everything that Larry was responsible for, Fritz went on to hire a lawyer, Harry Farnham, who recommended that he undergo psychological testing at an area hospital. After several days of intense evaluations, doctors could not say he was willfully deceiving anyone. It truly appeared as though he had no recollection of ever being Larry Bader. Fritz would go on to tell the Akron Beacon Journal, and I quote, I am John Fritz Johnson, and I have never heard of this Bader man until this matter came up. End quote. He seemed to be more confused than upset by the whole situation. He did admit that he looked like Larry and that they both shared a love for archery, but beyond that, he didn't care to explore Larry's memories at all. He just wanted this Larry situation to go away and him move on with his life. And apparently his doctors told Fritz that even trying to examine his past could be psychologically damaging. So Fritz would tell a reporter, and I quote, don't you understand? All of a sudden I found out that 30 years of my life never happened. You see, I really do have 30 years of memory as Fritz Johnson. What am I supposed to do with these 30 years? Throw them out the door, end quote. I mean, yeah, because they're made up 30 years. They're not real, they never happened. So yeah, throw them out the door. I mean, really? Now, if it was proven that Larry committed fraud, then he was looking at legal consequences, but no one could prove that. Instead, Fritz's lawyer argued that surgery to remove his cancerous lesion may have affected his memory. Perhaps he once knew why Larry disappeared and Fritz appeared, but there was little hope of finding answers now. So because Fritz was found for living a double life, KETV would end up firing him. Nancy left him and their marriage essentially erased because he was already married. And Nancy would go on to tell a reporter, I just don't know what to think, end quote. Well, 
Me neither, Nancy. Me neither. Soon after Fritz was fired, he would find himself working as a bartender again, earning $100 a week, which $50 of that went to go to Mary Lou for child support and $20 went to Nancy. So he was left with only $30 and would end up moving back to Omaha. Now, at first, Mary Lou didn't really say much to reporters. She mainly kept to herself. But in August of 1965, her and Fritz decided to meet in Chicago and she brought along their four children. But after Afterwards, he would still insist that they were strangers. He doesn't remember meeting, marrying, or having a family with her, which I'm assuming broke her and their kids' hearts. Mary Lou eventually would speak to a reporter saying, I am hopeful he will eventually remember. He's convinced himself that he doesn't recognize anybody. Learning he was alive was unreal. It was sort of like a numbness. It was like an emptiness when I thought he was drowned, end quote. That is so sad. Imagine you believing that your husband drowned for eight years years and then all of a sudden he appears alive but living a whole new life i would feel hurt i would feel sad I, I guess numbness is a good word to put it i mean i don't really know maybe she moved on but i don't think so it didn't really say if she did so i don't know just really sad i feel for her and then not long later in september of 1966 fritz's cancer came back, but it was in his liver this time, and he would end up passing away. Now, his passing away made people wonder how they were going to pay their respects to a man who lived two separate lives. They ended up having a service for him in Omaha under the name John Fritz Johnson. Then the next day, they had his body transported to Akron so he could be buried in a family plot at Holy Cross Cemetery as Lawrence or Larry Joseph Bader. Now, people still question whether Larry or Fritz whichever you prefer to call him, had suffered from some kind of injury during the night of the storm or had a neurological disorder. There is something I never mentioned in the beginning of this episode, and that is that Larry was in a lot of debt before he disappeared. He also failed to file his taxes between the years of 1951 to 1957. So he was in a lot of trouble. Also, he paid on a life policy and had a suitcase with him, which I did mention, but is still really weird. So I'm assuming that's the same suitcase he was seen with when he was asking for a bartending job in Omaha. But how did he get a fake Navy license so fast? Unless he'd just been planning this for a while. I guess it makes sense if he's been planning it for a while but still weird however if he was telling the truth about having 30 years of memories as Fritz then it's very possible that Larry experienced disassociative amnesia which is a rare condition where the person has no memory of their life due to trauma or stress now when someone is in a disassociative state they have an urge to travel and may invent a new personality settling in a new area with no recollection of how they got there. Now there was a similar case in 2005 when a lawyer and father of two in New York disappeared. He was found six months later living in a homeless shelter in Chicago under a new name. Now once he was found his wife revealed that he had been overcome by stress relating to his experience in Vietnam as well as being near the World Trade Center on 9-11. But it's unlikely that Larry would have suffered from amnesia for nearly a decade. Memories don't just erase themselves, they usually return. Now, if he did experience a total erasure of his previous existence, at least some of the remnant lingered from his past because he still had a love for archery, and while he may have believed his nickname Fritz came from an orphanage, that was inspired by his previous life as well. You see, as a cookware salesman, his boss was named Mr. Zeft. His first name was Fritz. Honestly, guys, I think he was in trouble financially and knew it. So I think he left his family with a life insurance policy payout, of course, and then picked up and started another life. He possibly tried to lay low at first, but enjoyed the life he was creating and just got lost in it because he wasn't really trying to lay low after his career started to pick up. Like he wasn't afraid if anyone saw him. Now I do think it's weird that he never came clean even on his deathbed, but nevertheless, I still think he faked it. That's just my opinion. But I wanna know what you all think. Do you believe he faked his death? Or do you believe he really did experience some weird form of amnesia and somehow created 
a whole new life. Well, I don't know. Let me know down in the comments or talk to me over on Instagram. That's going to be it for me today, guys. I hope you enjoyed this story. If you did, be sure to hit that like, subscribe button, and notification bell. It really does help out my channel. Or if you're listening to my podcast, please be sure to leave me a review. But either way, I'm really just happy you guys are here watching and listening to these stories. I really do enjoy bringing these stories to you and us talking about it in the comments and you guys giving me your opinions and ideas. I think it's really cool. <laughs> I love the little community we're building. So anyways, I hope you guys have a very blessed day and I'll see you later. Bye.